within blue waters flow Where westward currents go Rests the wooden hull and planking of a craft Quiet watch now, embracing fore and aft Deadly gales, relentless blow Took her down to lay below To see an 1856 vessel that's almost fully preserved with all parts working is an unusual thing. To make it even more unusual, it's underwater. Shipwrecks in the Great Lakes are very uniquely situated and they're, they're preserved incredibly well compared to most shipwrecks in marine environments and it's basically because there's no salt in the water and there are no critters in the water that directly eat these kinds of things. The shipwrecks here that are from the middle 19th century, some are literally intact just as if they can still sail again if you took the water out of them. The masts are still standing, the rigging still in the mast, the artifacts may be distributed about the deck or in the cabin and it's, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to see vessels like this that are so well preserved. In 1981 Chuck Feltner realized this preservation firsthand as he discovered a sailing vessel just west of the Mackinac Bridge that hadn't been seen since 1856. It certainly was um, a great thrill to go down in the water and see this big looming object and realize that you're the first human being that's been there with the Sandusky in 120 years. Located near the top of Lake Michigan, the Sandusky rests in 80 feet of water. Well, the Straits of Mackinac is a beautiful place. It, it is beautiful with the bridge, with the islands, with the, the water is always a magnificent blue, but mostly uh, the significant history that exists there from the Native Americans to the voyagers and the forts that were developed. Uh, our American history in a large part started right there. History records that a small 110-foot twin-masted ship sailed into the Straits during a large storm. At least one ship reported seeing the Sandusky with sail damage as it passed Beaver Island. I know she was bound from Chicago to Buffalo with grain and a crew of seven. And uh, she encountered a gale and uh, simply went down in the Straits. Uh, and it isn't clear if there was damage to the hull or if she just capsized and went down. Um, that's not entirely common, but uh, apparently the crewmen were able to cling to the masts. Even after the ship went down, the masts were standing out of the water. But because of the weather, no other vessels were able to render assistance and they were all fighting for their own survival. Somebody reported it out there with these people on it and a vessel was sent from Mackinac Island out to see if they could help them out. And they made one pass at it. When they came back, the guys were gone. This sad reality was realized as divers explored the wreck for the first time. We were on the bottom looking around and, and then I saw this upturned boot and it was stuck in the sand. And of course I thought it was just a boot. <laughs> and then I remember, and he was with me and I tried to pull it out and then I realized that it wasn't coming out. And of course, I didn't do anything else with that boot. That certainly brought home the significance of what happens to these shipwrecks when people go down with the ship. The shipwreck's profile matched the information known about Sandusky, the last known location, the two masts, and the overall length. But details from the fallen foremast helped Chuck narrow down what he had found. Finally, I realized that a brig used mast ups connected to a square sail. And the sail goes up because they pull the hooks up. Well, I go out there and look at it again, here are all these mass hooks down there. So I concluded it was a brig. A brig was an idea adapted from fast ocean going vessels. Square sails allowed for more speed, which was ideal when carrying perishable cargo like grain. But they required more crew and were tough to configure in the narrow waters like the Straits. Brigs were fairly common and uh, they never 
really competed successfully with schooners. But uh, during that era, they, they were fairly common. And uh, that may explain her loss, actually. In a gale, a square rigger was considerably more difficult to, to handle. It was harder to send the crew aloft in a gale to take in the sails. Uh, so they were definitely more vulnerable. Chuck and Jerry now had a positive ID on the ship, and they spent months filming the wreck before word got out about their find. Immediately, all kinds of dive boats showed up. And, and uh, I would go out early on Saturday morning. About 10 minutes behind me was a, a flotilla of dive boats tracking me all the way. The next weekend I go out there and it looked look like a, a boat show because <laughs> there were 20, 30 boats out there. It got a lot of attention from the divers. The Straits has an impressive collection of shipwrecks, from steel vessels to schooners. But this new find had something no other wreck had, and divers were eager to see it for themselves. The figurehead of the ram's head, is what I think it is, was something that I, I'm not sure you could see anywhere in the Great Lakes. It was just so magnificent. It makes the Sandusky very unique. There, It was an early shipwreck, you know, it went down in the 1850s, so it was a little bit finer than the later canal size schooners that came about that were a bit more utilitarian and not quite as fancy. Uh, very few of the sailing craft around the Great Lakes have uh, figureheads or scroll heads or anything like this anymore, with a few exceptions, and uh, it really made the, the wreck that much more of a desirable dive destination to be able to see something like this and to kind of see its uh, antiquity on the, on the lake bottom. For Great Lake shipwrecks, it's very rare. These vessels were the trains of their era and didn't carry much decoration. That sort of ornamentation uh, too was uh, a tradition brought from the old country. And uh, in some cases it was purely decorative. Uh, in other cases it was, it was sort of spiritual in its origins. So we see all sorts of different configurations, uh, you know, symbols, uh, figure carvings, that sort of thing. We studied that thing to death. Saw all kinds of still pictures from every angle. I talked to all the figurehead experts around the country and nobody had any idea what it was. In fact, Jerry was the one that looked in and said, that's a ram's head. And um, we all looked in and said, sure, <laughs> that's, that's close enough. Only three years after its discovery, Sandusky was now a major attraction for divers. Chuck feared that most of the wreck would be stripped and apparently the scroll figurehead was one of the targets. We were told by some of the people involved that was very loose. And I never saw it loose. And you'd go up and rattle it and it wouldn't move. And um, three weeks later, it was very loose. And some guy took it off saying that, well, if it stayed that way, somebody's gonna steal it. So he took it off and took it to a museum in South Haven, I believe. The original scroll had eventually made its way to Lansing and then to the NOAA facility at Alpena. This is uh, the scroll head or the figurehead from the Sandusky up in the Straits and it was removed from the wreck and replaced by a replica piece and it has since been preserved and is within the state of Michigan's Maritime Heritage Collection housed here in uh, the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center at, in Alpena. Underwater, the figurehead looked indestructible, and the cold, clear waters protected it for over 100 years. Something like this, it, it looks very sound underwater, it looks really uh, robust and tough. Um, as soon as it dries out, even though it's in fresh cold water where it was very well preserved, if it's dried out prematurely, it will start to fall apart. And oftentimes something like this would, would become a pile of wood chips in a matter of just a few months or a few years. And so it had to go through a genuine uh, conservation process that was pretty lengthy and costly. Um, but in the long run, it stabilized it enough so that it can be completely dried and exhibited. In 1989, divers returned a replica figurehead to the Sandusky, carved by Tony Gramer and Bill Covington. 
This was a major shift in diver attitudes towards shipwrecks, where divers spent tens of thousands of dollars to preserve a wreck rather than loot it. Legislators also moved in the late 80s to better protect underwater resources. In 1929, basically the state had uh, passed a provision that said that uh, they were going to try to protect antiquities. And that provision kind of was all encompassing. It just said anything under control by the state. And that included, you know, uh, you know burial sites on land. And it kind of uh, didn't specifically earmark uh, the treasures within our Great Lakes. Um, it wasn't until later on that we specifically earmarked shipwrecks and bodies within the Great Lakes system that were protected. July 2nd of 1980, we had a cutoff date that said that if any items was taken prior to that, uh, they were permissible. But anything after that particular date, you needed to have a permit uh, to take anything or it was illegal to, to remove from the Great Lakes or the preserve system. Further enhanced in 1994, Public Act 451 made it a misdemeanor to remove historical artifacts from the bottomlands, which includes Lake St. Clair. Michigan also created a network of preserves surrounding the state with Alger and Thunder Bay enacted in 1981, the Straits and Thumb area in 1985, and Whitefish Point in 1986. Since that time, 13 preserves have been created to protect shipwrecks all around the peninsulas penalties can be pretty substantial. Basically, if you remove an artifact, um, it's, a, it's a misdemeanor and it carries a f uh, fine of uh, up to $500 and six months in jail. But if it's from a preserve system or if somebody has been convicted of doing that before, that penalty can be enhanced to be a felony, a, a 10 year felony and a $15,000 fine and anything that they use to, in the conveyance to take that artifact illegally can be seized. So their boat, their dive gear, all those types of items can be seized. Seizure of equipment is enough to keep diver charter operators on the lookout for clients who may take artifacts during their visits. I have had to tell people to put spikes back down. Yeah, you know, they come up with a spike and what are you doing with that? Please put it back where you found it. And uh, you know, it's not there to be taken and I'm not going to risk my, uh, my boat and my license and my livelihood because you want to take an iron spike uh, from old shipwreck. I think the community as a whole understands that there's a very uh, unique historical value to our underwater wrecks and things of that nature. So uh, part of our mission is not only to educate the public but also to protect it. Last year our officers dedicated 900 hours toward shipwreck protection out on the Great Lakes all the way from uh, Lake Michigan all the way up to Lake Superior. Today, conservation officers are patrolling Bowers Harbor in the Grand Traverse Bay Underwater Preserve. It's late in the season, but that could mean opportunity for those who try to steal from a shipwreck. Actually, uh, we do encounter divers this time of year. Uh, there's less recreational activity out there. Um, however, the, they are limited uh, because of the uh, seas, how often they can dive. But uh, this is a time of year where uh, somebody that was going to uh, take advantage of less marine activity would be out and looking at those wrecks, maybe possibly to pilfer some of the artifacts. Steve is also a diver who knows the importance of the wrecks he protects. Well, it's part of uh, not only Michigan's history, but also uh, the history of the country. And uh, for somebody to come down and remove those artifacts, I can compare it with somebody going into a museum and uh, stealing artifacts out of a museum. There's a lot of uh, recreational divers that get quite a thrill out of going down and looking at these artifacts that haven't been touched for hundreds of years and seeing how they actually laid on the bottom and uh, tell quite an interesting story of, of what happened out there. When diving started in the Great Lakes, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of these shipwrecks became free-for-alls and they were really just, the laws weren't very clear about ownership, people didn't realize that they would be destro inadvertently destroying these shipwrecks by collecting off of them. But soon many of the wrecks that were known became empty hulls, if you will, and if you compare them to wrecks that are found now that are in deeper water perhaps, that there is more education. Um, within the diving community to not take things, to not disturb things on the bottom. They're treasure troves of, of, of artifacts and you compare them to vessels that have been dived for 30 years and there's nothing on those and so um, the Sandusky is sort of one of those earlier found wrecks that a lot of the artifacts kind of went messing off of. One of the things that made it change was a lot of the divers that had been around for a while 
had, had been diving on a particular wreck. And it came back five years later, and it was stripped. And uh, five more years, and practically carrying the deck boards off. And in fact, people did that on wrecks in the, in the Straits. The St. Andrew was a good example. There was a guy that made furniture, and he ripped the deck boards off of the St. Andrew, took them ashore and dried them all out correctly, and made sitting chairs and things. People seeing the deck boards disappear, now you got a shipwreck really disappearing in front of you, board by board. And so they're, they're built up a uh, peer pressure about taking artifacts. And over the years, that peer pressure became heavier and heavier and heavier until I would say somewhere around, maybe around 1995, uh, in the mid-90s, that the peer pressure was high enough that, and the DNR was clued in to where people bas basically stopped taking artifacts, more or less. <laughs> they didn't stop completely. Chuck found that theft wasn't always the problem when it came to artifacts on the Sandusky. He had the wheel and that big drum was mounted on a support post and then he had rope that, or wire that went all the way around the drum several turns. One end of it went out to one side of the rudder and the other end went out to the other side. And there it was, you could see how the whole thing worked. Well, I remember that wheel so well because it was, it was standing right there on the deck. Eventually, I remember in our diving it, it ended up on the side of the ship. All the divers had come up there and they wanted a picture, so they grabbed the wheel and were playing with it. And over time, it fell apart and uh, became nothing. So that artifact disappeared uh, as a result of overuse. Most times, divers don't even know that they're doing damage, especially when they try to anchor their boat over a shipwreck. Probably the number one cause of wreck deterioration now uh, as a cultural process is anchoring damage. You have a traditional way of going out to the GPS numbers, looking for the wreck on your bottom finder, throwing an anchor down and hooking the wreck. And year after year, dozens and dozens of anchors that are hitting this wreck every season does a lot of damage to it. New moorings have been proposed by the Michigan Underwater Preserve Council, which includes anchors like this one on Sandusky that screw into the bottom, keeping the line away from the shipwreck so that wave action and constant boat tension can't damage the historic vessel. I think it's getting a lot better, and I think that the grassroots behind that was uh, the local diving communities. And 30 years ago, a system of underwater preserves were established in the Great Lakes around Michigan, and that was established directly because of diver effort. And divers that had been visiting this and some of the divers that had been taking artifacts from wrecks realized that if this practice continues on, that all of these time capsules of history are gonna disappear. And so the underwater preserve system was, was established uh, in direct response to this. And there's an ethic now, I think, with the dive community that uh, it's, it's fantastic to take photographs, to explore these wreck sites, uh, to touch them, but to not take things off of them. So I think it's changed a lot through just basic education and experience in the diving community. Michigan Underwater Preserve Council, or the MUPC, helps to harness the volunteers within the 13 individual preserves in the state to increase diver access and to help preserve and promote underwater resources. Much of the policing of the wrecks comes down to the divers themselves. Charter operators know that no one would pay to see a stripped hull, so they're even more vigilant about customers looting the wrecks. We allowed that to kind of happen. We, you know, people would say, can I take this nail? It's like, well, okay, you know. But then when you, when you stop and think about it after, it's like, well, most of those nails that were taken, you know, sat on the mantle or stuck in the guy's dive bag for a period of time, and they got thrown in the trash, you know. And now we have the opposite situation coming back. Uh, we have artifacts that are coming back to the preserve and we're putting them back on the shipwreck. There's a rudder on the Herman H. Hetler that the Park Service had and it was on their beach. They called me up one day and said, oh, what do you want to do with it? And it's like, oh, let's put it back on a shipwreck. You get these sort of local dive charters and diving groups, whether they're in the Straits or in Sanilac or wherever around the state, 
and they become the custodians of these vessels. And they kind of keep their eyes and their ears open and they get this scuttlebutt about who's diving where. And, and it, these are their little babies, you know. These wreck sites have really meant a lot to, not only to their livelihood, but they have a genuine preservation ethic there. And, uh, and oftentimes they know who's coming and who's going and, and they share their information with the best position to moor on a, on a wreck if there is no established mooring system there, that sort of thing. Mooring has always been a difficult challenge for divers. Traditionally, that mooring was tied directly into the wreck site. And so you get something that looks fairly sound, like the, a bowsprit, for example, or a mast, or a windlass, or a capstan, or something like that. You put some chain around it, some poly line around it, and then you tie a boat to it time after time after time again, all throughout the summer season, and then the next year, the next year. And no matter how sound that piece of the shipwreck looked originally, ultimately this anchoring, this hanging on it is gonna do damage to it. And we've seen that directly on the Sandusky where the capstan was ultimately, it looked solid, but it was ultimately ripped away from the wreck and torn off of that. And uh, fortunately, we were able to save the capstan and local diving community uh, returned it to the wreck site. But I recall the, um, the foremast had been standing and fell and was lying on the um, railing on the port side. One time I came there and it wasn't there. It had fallen down. But it had fallen down because somebody put an anchor on it. And with it bouncing around, it worked it off of there and into the ground. Ultimately, we would like to see every wreck within the preserve system have a mooring buoy. Unfortunately, because of cost and liability, we can only focus on the most critical. And Sandusky was certainly one of the most endangered. State funding continues to be a challenge for policing some 38,000 square miles of Michigan bottomland. But most divers know it takes more than the DNR to protect these shipwrecks. It's a diving public that, that is ultimately responsible for policing themselves and making a correct ethic uh, that you don't take, you leave only bubbles, because basically the stuff has survived this many hundred years because of where it has been. And by moving it around, you're just making it susceptible to more damage. Even if you don't take something from a wreck, moving it out of its original position can disturb the story of that wreck site. And so when a uh, a diver collects all of the bottles on a boat and puts them up at the bow and kind of arranges them for a photograph, you're, you're messing up that original context and you, and you can't tell that story anymore. When you take something, it's literally like ripping a page out of a history book. You have so many natural processes that have acted against this wreck already don't contribute to its deterioration or its uh, not being able to tell its full story by removing artifacts or even moving them around. The timing of this new interest in shipwreck preservation couldn't be better, as inexpensive sonar and improved research capabilities will likely bring hundreds of new shipwreck finds. With the availability of modern technology, the wrecks are far easier to find. And uh, thank God that the divers, you know, have a growing respect for them and, you know, are willing to leave them undamaged and, and not to remove artifacts. It used to be done wholesale. You know, we know a lot of the older divers whose basements are just filled with artifacts. And, you know, they're not preserved or, or conserved in any way. And uh, even, even worse, uh, they didn't tag them to identify what ship they came from or anything. You know, so frankly, not only do they deteriorate, but they become kind of meaningless, you know. Um, that's, that's a real shame. How many wrecks are still out there? Historians who look at everything from newspaper articles to insurance claims still don't know exactly. I'm not sure what the overall lists are in within the Great Lakes, but there are thousands and thousands of shipwrecks, and there are thousands and thousands of historic reports of losses. And just the area of northeast Michigan, from say about Sheboygan down to the Harrisville area, uh, I maintain a database of about 250 missing vessels that went down in the lakes that are larger commercial vessels. They're not little fish boats necessarily or recreational craft from the 20th century. These are large kind of commercial ships. 
Of that 250 or so, only about half of them have been found. So there are a lot of ships out there. 30 years after its discovery, Sandusky still has some secrets to reveal. And those who found this unique brig hope it brings the same excitement that they felt when they first visited it. The big thing about those shipwrecks, they are so fragile. They're a living museum down there, but it, they, they are so fragile after being underwater for so long. Touching anything is going to disintegrate what's left, and I would just hope and pray that the people in today's world, the divers are, I feel, definitely preservation-oriented, and they would not do things that would de be detrimental to preserving the history of that wreck. And hopefully it'll last another hundred years for, for their children's children to be on to enjoy the history of the shipwrecks. Many scuba agencies have specialty courses for diving on shipwrecks, emphasizing safety and especially buoyancy control and proper fin techniques. We all know right from wrong. We all know what needs to stay there and, you know, and it's not supposed to be removed. As captains, we watch over it, you know, because that's our business. You know, we're bringing divers out there. When I'm diving or they're diving in another 10 years, 20 years from now, that stuff is still going to be there. You know, some of the wrecks have been here for a couple of hundred years already. Um, but if you look at what we've been finding a lot around the Great Lakes now are submerged forests and these tree stumps that are that are rooted in the bottom when lake levels were considerably different. And the preservation of some of these stumps are fantastic and, and many of them date to seven to 8,000 years ago. So conceivably shipwrecks in a fresh cold water environment like this can last as long as those stumps have. So I mean for literally thousands of more years. So it's our responsibility to, to try to, to help that along. Wooden hull or iron seam Former sail or hissing steam Whether drowned or collision resting there Let the ages hold them fast safe in our care Visit kindly in their sleep As their stories decades keep Be sure The Great Lakes bottom hole Wealth greater than chests of gold In the ghost fleet more to death Where divers go Watched and protected there Preserved in respectful care Where the sunlight turns the shadows into treasure Where the sunlight turns the shadows into treasure